That's right. We're back, folks. We're back. <laughs> oh, it's good to be back in Bible class. All right, let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to gather together around your word. We thank you for the gifts that you have given us in your word and sacrament. Uh, strengthen our faith through those things and through our discussion and conversation and study today uh, as we get back into Genesis. Uh, bless us and strengthen us during this time. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so it's been three weeks, so I'm expecting at least a few questions. So ask away. Any questions? Yeah. What part of Genesis are we on? We're on Genesis 2. Genesis chapter 2. We finished chapter 1 in less than a year. There we go. Any other questions this morning? My conference. So it is going to be at the seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, so the best seminary in the world. Where uh, so it's it's a it's a, it's kind of like two conferences sm smushed together. Uh, there the, there's the first part that is like Tuesday morning through Wednesday, like half of Wednesday. That's I, I believe that is like the exegetical portion of the conference. So we're looking at some, you know, biblical theme or texts and, and whatnot on there. And then the second half of the conference, you know, second half of Wednesday through beginning of Friday is, uh, it usually has some, torp, some sort of, you know, theme in history, like church history or the Lutheran confessions or, or something on that side of things. So it's both of those kind of smushed together. Um, to make what we, they call it symposia um, is what it is. So, so that's w where it will be and what it is. And um, so, yeah, so I'll be gone from um, basically we're leaving tomorrow so that I don't have to drive at like four in the morning on Tuesday. Um, so we'll be, we'll be gone uh, Monday through and we'll be getting, well, I'm actually skipping the, the Friday presentation because it's, it's, <laughs> It's, it, it's, it's all right. Do you want me to be gone longer? Is that what you're telling me? He does. He does. Yeah, right, right, yeah. I've got to have some time to write my sermon. Right? You, you don't want me winging it. Trust me. No. So, yeah. Yep. Any other questions? All right, great. All right, so, as I said, we are in Genesis chapter 2. Recap everything I did last year. God created the heavens and the earth in six days. There we go. Um, all right, so in ch chapter 2, so the, the first three verses of chapter 2 are kind of like a continuation of what we see in chapter 1. It gives us that seventh day um, in, in that creation week. So if someone could read uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. All right, so God creates the world in, in six days, you know, all of the plants, all the animals, the land, the seas, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything he, he's created in these six days. And mankind was, you know, the final and the, you know, the culmination of the creation week. And so now we get to the seventh day and it says that God rested. Now, this, this resting is not like God took a nap or, you know, he, he slept for all of the seven days, uh, that, that term of resting means to cease or to stop, and it can, it can mean to rest. Um, but basically, he, he ceased his creating work, um, and, and he, he stopped creating. He, he rested on that day, and he sets apart this seventh day as a day of rest. The Sabbath day is where, is where we get this from. 
uh, that this is the day that, you know, the Lord had been working and doing all of his creating on those six days. And on the seventh day, he ceased from that. Uh, and so, so that was the idea behind the Sabbath day, that you, you know, you do your normal work day and, and all of this stuff. Uh, but then you get to the Sabbath day and, and you, you are not to, to work uh, on that. Um, but it is a day that is, as, as we'll see throughout, you know, Exodus and Leviticus and, you know, throughout Jewish history, it is a day that is supposed to be dedicated to the Lord. Uh, you'd go to the, the synagogue or the temple and, uh, and you would worship uh, on, on that day. Yeah. Is that day Saturday or Sunday? Right. Uh-huh. And maybe he rested by enjoying looking at everything that he created. Right. So, yeah, so that first part um, is, is the, the, the Sabbath day, that day of rest. Is it Saturday or is it Sunday? Um, for, for the Jewish time, in the, in the time of, of Israel, Old Testament, um, the Sabbath day was Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown, right? Because remember, their days are reversed because, you know, largely because of what we see in, in Genesis. There was evening and there was morning the first day, second day, on, so on and so forth. And so, so that's when their day started. So, at, so Friday, as soon as the sun went down, that was the start of their Sabbath day, and it ended on the Saturday at sundown. This is why they had to really rush to get Jesus off the cross that Good Friday, because the sun was going down, and they weren't allowed to work, you know, in, in that sense, you know, on the Sabbath. So they had to, you know, rush to get him down so they could put him in the tomb before the Sabbath day happened. Um, in fact, that's why the, the women come on Sunday morning, that Easter morning, because they, they hadn't had the time to completely prepare Jesus's body for death. Um, and so they were coming that, that Sunday morning to finish the, the preparation of the body that they didn't have time for before. But lo and behold, they were quite surprised that the body was not there because Jesus had risen. And so, so that's what we see throughout the, the Old Testament. But then um, in the early church, uh, they, they switch. Um, it's not necessarily switching the Sabbath day, um, but really what we see is that the Sabbath day, it, it is a, a shadow of what is to come, right? So, so the, the Sabbath day is a day of rest. It is a day that is supposed to point to the Lord and of worship to him. And so the, the rest that you are supposed to have on the Sabbath foreshadows the rest that Christ brings by his death and resurrection. So he, he is the one who, who brings the true rest and really fulfills the Sabbath day. Um, this is why St. Paul will then say in, in, in one of his epistles that, you know, there, there's not one day that's holier than another day, you know, whether you worship on one day or worship on all the days, you know, um, don't, don't judge each other for that. Um, but you know, so you can, so after the point of Jesus's death and resurrection, right? The, the obligation to uphold the Sabbath day from, you know, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown is over, right? You don't have to do that anymore. Christ fulfills that Sabbath day. Um, so then, right, the early church then, you know, is trying to figure out when do we want to worship, right? The Jews say we have to worship on Saturday. We know that that's not true. Um, we, we see that, you know, the apostles will often go in, into the, the synagogues and, and the temple on the Sabbath day because they're trying to witness to the Jews and they know that the Jews are going to be there. So they'll have kind of a captive audience to, to preach Christ crucified and then be promptly sent off to prison and, and beaten for it. Uh, but they win some. Uh, and so, so they, they try and decide, you know, when, when are we going to worship? And so for, for the sake of, of good order and gathering together, right, the term church in Greek literally means gathering, right? So, so to be the church, you must gather, right? You can't be the church at, by yourself off at your home. The, the, the church can't, that is not the church. The church is gathering together. Um, and so... So the Christians were trying to decide, well, when are we going to do this? Well, they did it every day, uh, but they set apart Sunday as, as the, you know, the, the high day of worship during the week. Um, 
because they, and they called it, and we often still refer to it as the Lord's Day, right? That is the day that Christ rose from the dead. And so they celebrate that. Um, and, and, and we begin to see in, in the early church and even until today, Sunday being that day where Christians gather together to worship. Uh, Sunday is not, you know, any, you know, it's perfectly fine to worship on, on Saturday, right? Our, our 530 service. It's not like they're worse Christians than the people who gather on Sunday. No, not at all. Um, there, there's nothing inherently more, you know, special about these other days, but it's, it's really the idea of we want to be gathering together as much as we can. Um, and we see that in Acts chapter two, they're gathering like every day and having the Lord's Supper pretty much every day um, together to have that community, to be that church, that gathering together. Um, How do we keep the, the commandments? How do we keep, what do we keep holy? Right, right, yeah. If, if, yeah. How, do, how do we keep the third commandment, right? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Um, any of my confirmands know the meaning? No, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> any of the adults know the meaning? <laughs> no, I won't put you on the spot either because it's all right. Um, so, right, yeah, how do we keep the, the third commandment? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Uh, Luther, in, in his explanation of, you know, in the small catechism, he mentions nothing about the Sabbath day specifically. Um, you know, he says, you know, what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. So, so basically, the way that we keep the, that third commandment of honoring the Sabbath day is by loving God's word, honoring his word, wanting to come and gladly hear and learn it. Uh, you are all hopefully keeping the third commandment by being here in Bible class, uh, wanting to come and hear and learn the word of God. Um, and so, right, we break that third commandment when we despise God's word, when we don't want to listen to it. You know, when we say, you know, oh, yeah, you know, there's church this Sunday, but I'm just really tired, so I, I'm just not going to go. Or I, there's more important things that I'd rather do than go to church, and so I'm going to go and do those things. That is a breaking of the Eighth Commandment. You're not honoring God's word. You're not, you know, holding it sacred and wanting to gladly hear and learn it, right? Every Sunday or Saturday, we should wake up and be like, yeah, I can't wait to go to church. Right? That's, that's what we should be doing. I get to go and hear the word of God read and preached to me. I get to hear you know, the words of Jesus proclaimed to me. I get to have the Lord's Supper. Right? That should just energize us and be the high point of our entire week. Church on Sunday should be, the, it is the most important thing you do every week, but it should be the thing that you look forward to most of all, right? which of course we all understand that we fall short of. Because we've all had Sundays where we don't want to go to church. Uh, I've had Sundays like that too, believe it or not, believe it or not, right? So, uh, you know, the law does an excellent job of showing us where we fall short. Uh, but so really in, in keeping that, that Sabbath day, honoring the Sabbath day, now that the day itself has been fulfilled in Christ, um, the way that we keep that is by honoring his word, wanting to, to hear it and learn more about it. Um, that's how, how we keep it. Would you, could you say that conversely, the despising of devotion at home is about the same thing then, according to Luther's explanation? Yeah. So it, like, uh, well, I did that. On, like, I'm excited to be here and hear about it, but Monday morning comes and it's like, mm, devotions, eh. Yeah. Right, yeah, the de Which devotions at home. Does same, that same realm? I would think. Right, does that? Yeah, do de do daily devotions fall into the third commandment? I would say yes. Yeah. Right, you know, you aren't, and this this may be offensive to some of you, but you know, it's the truth. If you are only in the Word of God on Saturday or Sunday, and you're not in it the rest of the week, you're not living a Christian life. That's that it, the, uh, Christianity is not just a weekend thing. It's not just a one or two hour thing that you do on, on Saturday or Sunday. It is a lifestyle. It is a worldview. It, it should permeate everything you do, every, every action you take, every decision you make. Uh, these are, this, this is what it means to be a Christian, is to be in the Word of God. And, right, and so, 
right? This, this includes, of course, uh, first and foremost, you know, our, our worship gathering on, here at church, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, but that also needs to continue throughout the week, right? You know, Luther in the small catechism talks about, you know, you know as, as a father, you know, the head of the household, you know, you know leads the, the children. He has, Luther has prayers that you make at the beginning of the day, uh, at meal times, at, at the end of the day, right? There, there's at least, you know, even if you only pray at one meal, right, there's th- three prayers that you should be praying throughout each day. Um, and, and so, right, the prayer and looking at scripture, it's, it's what we as Christians should be doing. We see this in, in Acts chapter 2, right? They're, they're gathering together all the time. Um, I'll flip to it and read it. It's, so it's Acts chapter 2, after Pentecost, right, all the, the great uh, conversion that happens there, 3,000 are added, even though of the people who are there, 3,000 is a very small number. Right? Far more people walked away from the message of Christ than believed in Christ that day, even though we like to think, wow, 3,000, that was a lot. It was like there are probably millions there, so not, not that great of a showing uh, for the church that day, um, if you're looking at just numbers, right? which we should not do. Um, but Acts chapter 2, um, verse 42, it, t- it gives kind of a brief summary of, of the early church in Acts, what we see. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The prayers there being like the prayers, the liturgy, those kinds of things. Not just prayer in general, but, but actual prayers that we do in worship. Uh, the awe, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belonging, belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Right, and so, so we see, right, that the, it's not like these Christians in the early church were just gathering on Sunday, or just gathering on the Sabbath day. They were gathering every single day to, to, to look at and learn the teaching of the apostles, uh, to have that fellowship together, to be having the Lord's Supper together, eating meals together. Um, that eating meals together part is really what threw the Roman Empire for a loop, right? They, they were you know, they didn't, they didn't have meals together, right? The only time you ate with someone, if you were a Roman citizen, was if you were trying to make allies and, like, business deals with people, right? The, you, you very rarely had just fellowship meals with anyone. Um, and so the, Christ, the early Christian church, right, they're having meals with each other all the time. They're having the Lord's Supper almost daily. And, and that is part of the reason why, you know, Rome didn't like the early Christians, uh, because they thought, well, they're, obviously they're planning something, right? If, if they're meeting together this often in private, they've got to be up to trouble. And, and so that, that's where, you know, part of uh, a lot of the, the persecution came in, you know, not to mention, you know, the fact that they said that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. So that was a big thing, too. Um, but, right, so, so they're having this fellowship together. They're in the Word. They're, they're looking at the apostles' teaching and, and learning about it. And so, yeah, absolutely, we as Christians, right, we should not limit our time in the Scriptures and our devotional times, our prayer time, to just on Sunday and Saturday, right? If, if that is what you do, right, then, you know, it, it won't come as a shock that people who do that will often fall into the temptation of saying, well, church is secondary, Right? And, and these other things that I do is more important. Right? It's, it's more important for me to, to make sure I have enough rest to go to school during the week than to get up and go to church on Sunday. Um, the opposite should be true. If you are so tired and exhausted, and kids don't use this as an excuse, but if you are so tired and exhausted that you physically cannot get up for church, then you need to skip a day of school. Rest Skip a day of school. It's more important for you to be at church on, on the weekend than it is for you to be in school. 
your pastor said it. You can, you, can, <laughs> you can point your teachers to me. That's fine. I will go to the mat on that. Um, church is the most important thing that, that you should be doing, right? And, and so... Um, and the less that you're in the Word, the easier it is to forget what you did Sunday morning. Yeah. You fill yourself with stuff on TV and on the radio or whatever, whatever you read that's, quote, secular. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you're so far away from what you were on Sunday morning. Right. And I'm saying that because... <laughs> you speak from experience, yeah. <laughs> it's all you guys, it's me. Right. Well, we, you know, we, we see this from the Israelites, too, right? They, you know, they, they have their times where they are faithful and they're hearing the word and, you know, they're, they're staying faithful to God. But then, the, you know, the more and more they get removed from that the more they forget the, the word of God, they forget what God has done for them in the past, um, they, they fall into idolatry. And, and so, you know, Satan is always at work and he's most at work here in this place, right? Satan could care, he couldn't care less about the, the unbeliever, right? He's got them in his pocket. He doesn't have to work hard against them because he's got them already. It's you who he doesn't have. Right? And so he's going to work extra hard to try and, and bring you away from Christ. And right, the, the first and the easiest way to do that is to get you to not read your Bible during the week. Right? Because, you know, other things come up and that, that's always the first thing to go. Right? I, sp I speak from experience too. Right? It's, it's so easy to say, well, I have all of these other things to do. Right? Oh, I usually start my day with devotions, but oh, I'm really tired. I slept in by, you know, accident or I slept through my alarm. Uh, I'll, I'll get it in the evening, and then something else comes up. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up tomorrow. You know, if you've ever tried to do, you know, read the Bible in a year or, you know, whatever, right, you, you, you do pretty good on those first few days, then something comes up, and so you're a day behind. It's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll make it up tomorrow. Well, then, you know, then you miss that day, and now you have two days to make up, and you're like, oh, man, I have so much to read now, right? You know, and, and so it just piles up, and you end up not reading at all. Um, and, and so it... It is something that Satan works at in us to try and get us out of the Word of God, um, to, to try and make it not a priority. Um, because the more he can get us away from Christ, the better it is for him, right? And so, so it's a very hard thing to stay disciplined in. Um, it's a hard thing to do, um, but, but do it. Right. Be, be in the word, even if it's just one chapter a night. Right. You see all of these plans that are like, oh, yeah, read the Bible in a year. That's great if you can do that. But if you don't have the time to read five chapters a day, right, just read one. Right. No, God doesn't say, you know, thou must read the entire Bible every single year. Right? This is part of why you go to church on Sunday, because the lectionary does a great job of it doesn't cover every single word of Scripture. But it pretty much covers every topic within Scripture, right? So if it, it does a very good job of covering the full counsel of God. Um, and so if you're attending church throughout the year, you're going to hear all of these different topics and all of these things brought up, um, which is one of the reasons why I hold to the lectionary, because it is such a great blessing, right? If it was just me coming up with texts every week, then I would, you know, I would be more prone to preach on the stuff that I, you know, find more important. And so I'll, I'll preach on this area where there's this other area that probably should be preached, but I'm like, eh, I don't really want to talk about that. And the temptation also is to not preach on the areas that are uncomfortable, right? Those, those areas that, well, people might get offended if I talk about this, so I'm going to spend more time talking about this. That temptation is there too. Whereas with the lectionary, if I've decided I'm going to hold to the lectionary, when a text comes up, I have to preach it. Now, we have three readings, so I can wiggle around a little bit, too. Um, I do like to try and, and connect all the readings, because they are very much connected. Um, but, right, the, the Word of God is given there. So, right, if you're going to church, you get a lot of that, um, especially if we, you know, we use the three-year lectionary, so we cover more scripture than the one-year lectionary does. There's pros and cons. We can talk about that later. Um, but, but there is still stuff that you miss if, if you're just hearing the scripture at church, right? There, there are things that you don't get, um, you know, that you don't hear. And so it's important to be reading even just one chapter. If it takes you 10 years to read through the whole Bible, if you're reading your Bible, that is a good thing a good and God-pleasing thing to just be in the Word. 
Um, and so, so yeah, I would encourage you, you know, if, if you are doing devotions, you know, good job, keep it up. If you aren't doing devotions, just start small. Read, read one chapter a day or, you know, psalm. pray one psalm a day, right? Psalms are good. They can be really short. There can be really long ones. Um, but, right, even those you can break up into smaller chunks. Yeah, Portals of Prayer is a, is a great devotional tool as well, right? It gives you a little scripture to read and the devotion itself, right? It's not one of Luther's sermons that, you know, would be 40 minutes for you to read. Uh, but it, it's, it's just a, a nice short devotion, and, right, and that's fine. That's good. Yeah, and that is a great practice, right? You know, any, any scripture that you can be in, right? Don't, and and if, you, if you are on a plan, right, and, and, and I've, I've told this to my confirmands too, right? If, if you, because I have them going through a two-year reading plan of, of the scriptures. And, and I've said, right, if, if you for some reason or another get, you know, way behind on it, don't really worry about trying to, to catch up. Right. And, and, you know, if you're if you're four days behind and so you're, you know, eight, nine chapters behind. Right. It's better for you to skip all of that and, and start where we're at and continue with the, you know, the two or three chapters a day. Then then to say, oh, well, this is so much and then not read anything. Right. It's better for you to be in the word, even if you miss a chunk. Right. You know, eventually. Right. If you're reading the scriptures, you know, eventually later in your life, you'll get back to the point where you missed. And, and you'll read and say, oh, yeah, that, that was a good thing. I'm glad I read that now. Um, but that's... No, oh, no, yeah. When you catch up like this, like, you're not really getting much out of it. You're like, oh, I'm just reading it. Yeah, it's fast. Zipping through it. Zipping through yeah, it. Yeah. You know, like, for myself, I've done that in the past. It's like, well, that was kind of really worthless because I didn't mm-hmm. read it. Not because I was just reading it because I was supposed to. So right. Yeah, well, and, th- and that's why I, I'm a really big advocate for it. just reading, yeah, like, I mean, do your devotions, whatever you want. Um, I, you know, when, when times get short, just one chapter a day, right? That gives you time to really read into that chapter. If you are reading from the Lutheran Study Bible, right, you can, it gives you time to look at the study notes, too, and kind of, you know, look at that and what they say, and, right, because we don't just read the Bible to read through it. And say, oh, well, well, I have to. I, I read the words, right? But, but I, I don't. It's not a novel. I, I didn't. I, I don't even remember what I read, yeah. right? You know, um, that that doesn't really. I mean, I, I can't say it doesn't help you because it's the word of God, right? And when it's you know read, you know, it goes into you, and the Holy Spirit can use that. So I'm not going to say that that's not helpful. Uh, but right, we are we're to meditate on the scriptures and to you know to look at what is it? Yeah, inwardly digest it. Um, that that that's what we're supposed to do, right? And so so I I am absolutely a advocate for reading the scriptures slower and, and more thoroughly than just you know oh yeah I read it in a whole year I don't know anything it said but I read it in a year right? It's just like one of those achievements that really doesn't mean all that much. Um, cause you, cause even if you read it slowly, if it takes you 10 years, like you'll get there, right? You'll, you'll read through the whole scripture. We should read through the whole scripture. Um, even numbers, even number, especially oh, yeah. numbers, especially n- numbers is so good. You know, just because of that, we're going to do a study of numbers. No. <laughs> oh no. I think it's about time we cancel you. Yikes. Yikes. Well, God, God has called me here. I not know. <laughs> so. I, and I, can't argue with you. <laughs> I know. I know. That's a cliff notes version of numbers. <laughs> yeah. You're acting in my duty. Yes. Yeah. You actually mentioned something that that led to that comment. It said preaching the things that aren't that aren't comfortable that aren't, you know, warm and fuzzy, mm-hmm. you know, like, like, uh, like our sacraments, the uh, communion. We, every time we get together in, in corporate worship, we have communion or the, the Eucharist and, and 
some people don't understand that. That's uncomfortable for some people. You know, um, cohabitating outside of wedlock. You know, those things are. Um, those things that society says. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that, and I think that I, part of the attraction to me to the Lutheran Church is having pastors that are willing to preach those things. Mm -hmm. You know, I. I, I have a large number of my family members that are Baptists, and you know they, they get entertained on Sunday. They do get entertained, and they, and they get to and they and they get to work. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know that they get preaching. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The yeah preaching that that's one of those things that you know between Lutherans and other denominations. Um, we, we view vastly differently, right? For, for, for most denominations, most Protestant evangelical denominations, they see the sermon as, well, you know, pastor is, you know, kind of the most educated in the scripture. He's the most spiritual guy here. And so this is his chance to, you know, kind of get up and tell us what he's learned this week um, and, and it's really a, a, you know, it's a 40, 45 minute Bible study, right? You know, th th if I were a Baptist pastor, right, I would be, this is what I would be doing, except not asking questions. Um, right? I, I would just, you know, walk through a text and, and it would just be Bible class, just telling you what I learned in my studies of it this week. We don't, as Lutherans, that's not how we view the sermon, right? As Lutherans, we view the, the sermon that as, me, as God's called man, I am up there, and God is speaking through me. God, God is proclaiming his good news upon all of you, that you would hear and your faith would be strengthened. The sermon is an act of God, which is part of why, and the main reason, well, it is the main reason, why I'm up in the pulpit, in, in, in the sanctuary, because it's, it's not just me, you know, you know, walking in front of everybody, you know, just me and you, you know, at that point, right, you know, I'm, I'm a human being too, but at that point, I am God's representative speaking his word to all of you. And so I stand up in the pulpit to show that this is God proclaiming his word to you, right? And, and so the sermons in the Lutheran perspective is, an, is a proclamation of the word. It's not just a study. It's not just a, hey, let's talk about what these things mean. But it is me proclaiming these things to you um, from, from God's word, right? So it, it's a completely different mindset of, of what the sermon is about. Um, so, yeah, so there, there, I mean, and that's just one area within the, the worship setting uh, that Lutherans are different than a lot of other um, Christian churches around the area. But we don't have time to go into all that. So. With Chuck, Chuck's nephew is a Baptist pastor, and we watched it. We watched the online service, and it is—it's a forty-minute Bible study mm -hmm. in the in the sermon place. Right. Yeah. So. Right. And and the nice thing, right, is that you know if they're if they're reading the Word of God, right, the 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 people can be hearing that and their faith is still strengthened, right? This, we, we don't say that, oh, well, all Baptists are, you know, not hearing the word and they're all going to hell, right? We don't say that. Um, because, you know, if they're, if they're hearing the word, even if the pastor, you know, is, is saying, you know, some wrong things, right? They, then the, the nice thing is that they don't usually talk too much about the Lord's Supper and, and baptism because they're not really that important to them, um, which shame on them. But, um, but that's, you know, they're, they're hearing the word of God, and right, that can have an effect. There are plenty of Baptists who will believe, oh, yeah, of course Jesus' body is, and blood are there because Jesus says it is, right? And then that's when we have to point out, well, you know that Baptist churches don't believe that, right? And they're like, what? And then, you know, that's where it starts the conversation. Same thing with baptism, right? Um, well, you know, St. Peter says that baptism saves you, so of course it, it, it saves you. It's like, well, Baptists don't teach that. And, and it can be an, an eye-opening thing uh, to have those conversations with people. But other times they're, you know, they're dug into what they've been taught and, you know, that, you know, the Lord forgives them. They'll be Lutheran when they get to heaven. It'll be fine. Um, That's what I'm talking about, brother. <laughs> yeah, man. It's, it's going to be a great party. Um, 
Where were, how did we get there? Oh, the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, yeah, yeah. Did you have something else? Talking about the, the Lutheran study Bible. Yeah. And the footnotes. Who is it that writes the footnotes to the study Bible? So who writes the study notes in the study Bible? Um, so there, there's a list in the front of the, the Bible that has the list of people who contributed to those. Um, we don't know who specifically wrote each one. Um, but it's different pastors, different theologians, seminary professors, right, you know. But it's things you can follow and, and learn from. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And, and it's written by, you know, you know, good Lutheran people, right? And I've said, right, they're, they're human, right? So the footnotes are not inspired, inerrant, you know, word of God like what's above. Um, so, you know, everything you read there, take with a grain of salt. But, but for the vast majority of things, they, they are very good things to look at and study. I came up with, uh, I think, three that in my Bible, and that's three questions and oh, okay. with the scripture. Uh-huh. Well, you can ask him next week. Okay. So. <laughs> I will. All right, all right. All right, anything else? All right, so yeah, God rested. We don't have to hold the Sabbath day specifically, right? We, but we want to gather together uh, to worship. So, all right, so then it, we, it changed the, you know, this is where we get a shift in the text. So verse 4 will then kind of take us back to creation. Um, and, and the rest of chapter 2 is really a more in-depth look at the creation of mankind. Um, as we said before, chapter one really is that, you know, view of creation from 20,000 feet. It's kind of, you know, the, the overview of, of everything that's created. And then chapter two really zooms in on the creation of, of Adam, of Adam and Eve. And so um, that's what we're going to see here. A lot of people will try and, right, you know, they say, oh, well, there's contradictions between, you know, chapters one and chapter two. Right? They, they are not meant to be right, identical. They're, they're meant to be a, a, a focus on the creation of man. So right, it's going to say, um, you know, verse 4, right? These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Right? And so, oh, well, look, see, one day. Right? In one day, God created the heavens and the earth. That's not what chapter 1 said, and so therefore the Bible is worthless. You shouldn't pay attention to it. And that's not what's being said. Um, first of all, in, in verse 4, right, we, and, and the, the ESV here text kind of makes it in kind of a, it, it emphasizes it's kind of poetic. We see the um, kind of the, uh, oh, what it, oh, shoot, I'm forgetting the term. Um, the step parallelism that we often see in the Psalms and Hebrew poetry, right? It starts off, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. That's line one. And then line two, right, is similar to that, but just slightly different. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, right? It seems almost redundant um, because that's just what Hebrew poetry does. It kind of restates what's being said. Um, here we do get, you know, it, you know, Yes, we, we've talked about the discussion of what day means. And day can mean not just a, a 24-hour period, right? It, it can mean, you know, right, here's a perfect example. In the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, in, in the time that this happened, right? Think about in the day of Moses, right? He, more than just one day, right? But, but that word is used. Now, the reason we hold to 24-hour period in Genesis 1, as we've talked about, is there's evening and morning, uh, and, and we, you see the, the week and the way that everything kind of builds out of that. You know, we, we've talked at length about all of that. So if you've forgotten, go watch them online. They're on our YouTube channel. Um, you can watch those classes. Um, but so, right, he, he gives, it gives kind of a summary of, you know, just a brief statement that God created the heavens and the earth, all this stuff. And then five, verse 5 and onward is going to focus specifically in on Adam. So if uh, someone could read real quick, we got just a little bit of time left, um, verses 5 through 9. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. 
and there was no man to work the ground. And the mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right, so um, so, so this, this first part can be where, where some people will say, oh, look, there's a contradiction between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Right, so it starts off saying, well, there was no bush of the field was yet in the land. Um, no small plant was in the field. Um, you know, before these things were, then God formed man from the dust of the ground. And then he created, you know, the garden. And so some people might look at that and say, well, look, see, back in Genesis 1, it said that the plants and things were created before Adam was. But here it's saying that Adam was created before the plants. And so they, they might see that as a contradiction. Uh, but what, what really is being spoken of here is that it's, it's talking about before the garden was planted, right? It's not talking about saying that there was no bush or no small plant on any of the earth at all, right? It's, it's, remember, it's specifically focusing in on man and where man would be. That's what we see in chapter 2. And so it's saying before the, the Garden of Eden was, was planted by God, Adam is, is created, right? And notice how Adam is created, right? He's formed from uh, the dust of the ground, um, which, you know, is not... Everything else was, was spoken into being, right? Everything else, God spoke and it was. Uh, but here, right, God takes extra care, extra time to, to create man, um, to create Adam specifically. And, and notice he, he breathes uh, into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a, a living creature, that, that he, God breathes into him. Our very life is a gift from God, right? And so, you know, people who don't, you know, the, the atheist still only has life because God has given him life, right? He, he, the, the atheist can deny God all he wants, but it's only by God that they are alive today. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we see this in Luther's explanation on the, the fourth petition in the Lord's Prayer, you know, give us this day our daily bread. And Luther says, you know, God provides daily bread to all people, even evil people, without our prayers, right? God loves us so much that even if we reject his existence, he's still going to take care of us, um, now, there's not salvation for the person who rejects God, but there, there is that provision for them in this life, hoping that they will come to, to faith at some point. Um, and so, so, so we see that, you know, God, God gives Adam life, um, and, then he, and then he plants this garden, right? He plants the Garden of Eden, um, and, and it gives, we, we get some hints as to the location um, in, in the next section. So let's go ahead and read that. Uh, if someone could read verses 10 through 14. A river flowed out of Eden to, the water, to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first river is Pishon. It is one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, I don't even know how to say that word. <laughs> Delium. And onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is uh, Gihon. Is that Gihon? Uh, sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> the name of the second river is Gihon. It is one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows out of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. All right. So we get these, these four rivers that are flowing out of Eden. So there, it says, right, there's a river. There's one river that flows out of Eden, and it kind of branches into these, these four rivers. Um, and so uh, the, the consensus has been, you know, as to the location of the garden, right? Where, where is the, where's the Garden of Eden? People are always trying to find it. 
the, the consensus, we, we can't know for certain, but the consensus is it's in that you know, Mesopotamian uh, area, kind of by the, I think it was the Persian Gulf that, that's right there. Um, right, we, we see that you know, the Tigris and the Euphrates that are, that are kind of there. These other two, um, the, um, the Pishon and, and, and Gihon, however you want to say those, I, I forget what the Hebrew pronunciations are. Um, you're right, we, we, we kind of guess at, where, at what those are. We're not entirely certain. Um, also, it's important to remember that the flood would have completely, you know, changed all of this, right? So, um, so that's going to throw off any attempts to really, you know, locate where it was. But it was something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, G- Jesus came to, he, he rose into heaven on Ascension Day, and then later he went over to America and started the true church. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry, I No. Yeah, I, I expect that from him, not not from not from you. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. That's uh, that's I'm I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. But yeah, so that's the kind of the the consensus of where the the garden would have been in that Mesopotamian area there, um, and so this is this is where you know God creates Adam, He puts this garden, and that's where life begins. And of course, that will you know spread as we will see. Adam and Eve are later kicked out of the garden. Um, they have to you know work the ground elsewhere. Uh, eventually, we'll get to right the Tower of Babel, which you know sends everybody out across the the entire expanse of the world because they can't talk to each other anymore uh, and so all right so so we see that the, the spread that you know leads to you know where we are today where there's people all over the face of the world um, but this this is kind of where we think uh, the Garden of Eden and and human life started so any questions on any of that All right. Well, we are at time, so we'll pause there. Um, that's a good place to stop. Next, next time we'll get into, into we'll, we'll get God's command to Adam that he can eat of all the, the, the fruit of, and the trees and the plants except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that and the creation of Eve uh, next week. Uh, let us close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the conversation and the study that we've had. Uh, We pray that you have used this time to strengthen our faith and our understanding of you and and how you work. Uh, Bless us this week as we go about our business. Keep us centered on Christ and and your word, uh, that we would uh, stay in that word and have our faith strengthened through that, that we may remain steadfast in you. Uh, Bless us and keep us uh, in you. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody.